Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Am I on here? What's the worst that could happen? Good morning. It's a, a great pleasure for me to be here in the heart of Europe. I have never been to Poland before, and, uh, and it's a real treat to be here. It's a beautiful city, and thank you very much for making me feel welcome here. Um, I want to thank Alex and, and Hubert and Magda for being such great hosts, making me feel comfortable. Um, I managed to sit in on, on uh, some of the sessions, the workshops yesterday, and I was very impressed with the quality of the students. I think that there's a lot of really smart and capable people here. Silicon Valley is not a place, it's a state of mind, and it's really nice to see that there's a Silicon Valley state of mind here, too. Are the, uh, any chance to get the house lights a little brighter? I like to look into people's eyes. So, okay, that's one way to do it. Um, would you indulge me for a moment? I have a long talk that I'm gonna drone through page after page, so I would like you to wake up a little better, and this is for me too. So would you stand up, please, everybody? Don't spill your coffee, but please stand up. and. And let's do the power pose together, like this. <laughs> now, an important part of this is the key eye. You go, ha! 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 ha. Yes! <laughs> I feel so much better. I hope you do, too. So, um, you'll, thank you. You'll notice that a lot of the backgrounds of my slides are this pastoral scene. This, is, um, this photograph was taken on Monkey Ranch. This is where I live in uh, Petaluma, California, about an hour north of San Francisco. And as you may have heard, we're beset by horrific for, uh, forest fires, grass fires. And the ranch is safe, cross your fingers. The, the fires remain about 30 kilometers away. But it all depends on the wind. It's pretty smoky there now, but we're doing good. Okay. Today, I want to talk about the way that I like to approach my work. And it's not unique, but it's somewhat rare. I call it working backwards. It's widely useful but most powerful is a tool for innovation and creativity. A less obvious application of its usefulness is in managing the creative process. Working backwards also gives you insight into the larger world and to what your responsibilities are as a citizen of that world. Simply put, working backwards means questioning every assumption before you accept it you first step backwards with genuine inquiry, and only then do you proceed forwards with knowledgeable confidence. Now, it may seem like a waste of time to question every assumption, but pushing, rushing and pushing in the wrong direction gets you nowhere, as this fellow discovered. The world is not breathlessly awaiting the release of your poorly conceived product. Now, working backwards gives you three main advantages. It helps you know your user and their goals, it helps you see possible solutions, and it helps you see the bigger picture. And I'll talk about each of these as we go. Now, you've probably heard that old adage, success is 1% inspiration and 99% perspiration. Now, there's a lot of truth to that. A little bit of vision can be the foundation for a huge amount of hard work. Working backwards is how you find the vision. And that's the 1% inspiration. But all the sweat, the 99%, comes from working forwards. You can't escape 
that huge quantity of perspiring work. It has to be done. The problem is that creating massive failures takes just as much hard work and perspiration. The difference between making a success and failure is the 1% inspiration that comes from working backwards. Now, what differentiates successful products from failures is something new and different, something better and friendlier, something that hasn't been done before, or something that has never been this easy to use or to learn. And we call such differentiation innovation. And it comes with a built-in conundrum. Innovation, by definition, is doing something counterintuitive, something that has never been done before. And if you have never done it before, it is a certainty that you don't know how to do it yet. Regardless of your previous experience with similar projects, the more innovative it is, the more it diverges from the known. Working backwards demands that you do things differently, or to use the proper management term, you're doing it the wrong way. Now you won't just be doing this in a vacuum, you have to fight for your right to work backwards. And working backwards pisses people off. I've always worked backwards. I just naturally question assumptions. I don't just want to see results, I want to see how things work. I don't just want to see the play, I want to see what goes on backstage. I'm a born rule breaker, a shit disturber, and the road less traveled guy. As a young man, I wore my hair long, I dropped out, and I always did what people said I shouldn't do. For 40 years, I've been designing, writing, and critiquing software and technology. Working backwards is my superpower. When someone tells me that I have to choose between A or B, I always choose C. And it really pisses people off. So over the years, I've invented many design tools for working backwards, like pair design and user personas. One of my oldest tools is an exercise called Pretend It's Magic. More than any other, it exemplifies the power of working backwards to break new ground and to frustrate conventional thinkers. Pretending it's magic is easy. You just ask yourself, how would we solve this problem if anything were possible? Typically, conventional design and engineering begins with a ritual recitation of constraints and requirements. These tell you what you can't do and what you must do. But this approach condemns you to doing what you already know in ways that you are already familiar with. It's a roadblock to innovation. It's assuming before knowing. It's working forwards before you've worked backwards. It emphasizes history, convention, old technology, old mental models, and the way we've always done things around here. Instead, it's better to work backwards. Start by throwing out everything, all of your assumptions, all those known limitations. For the moment, just assume that all technical problems can be solved, that all organizational problems can be overcome and that all resources are available to you. Only imagine the possibilities. What does the user want to end up? Where does the user want to end up? And what would make the user happy? For example, if you have to build a bridge across a river, you would normally start by building concrete abutments and then laying steel girders between them. But when you build a bridge backwards, you start by asking, what is the fundamental purpose of the bridge? Who needs to get across the stream and why? Are there existing fords or ferries that could do the job? What else could the bridge be used for? Now you can see the objective with more clarity. You can better understand why this bridge needs to exist. And the essential feature set becomes clear. You can see what isn't needed, what doesn't belong and those tasks that don't need to be done anymore. 
More importantly, you can see opportunities to do more than people asked for, to go beyond the minimum requirements, to give people a car instead of a faster horse, or a whale instead of a cucumber, or to put a dent in the universe. You probably still have to build a bridge, but now you can clearly see how to build the bridge more efficiently, make it more effective for its users, and maybe be something more. Maybe, like a small Northern California town, the citizens realized that the simple footbridge they needed to build should do more than just get pedestrians across the Sacramento River, that its soaring tower should tell time, that it should unite their town and be a source of civic pride, that it could become a symbol of their city and revitalize it by becoming a popular tourist attraction. The Sundial Bridge, a simple but elegant crossing, is a huge success, and it has done as much for the country town of Reading as the Golden Gate Bridge has done for San Francisco. It's counterintuitive to make a bridge tell time and be a tourist attraction. When it was first proposed, it probably pissed off a lot of people. Now, when you work backwards, you take what you have and you improve it increment. I'm sorry, I, when you work forwards, you take what you have and you improve it incrementally. But when you work backwards, you examine its underlying purpose, what it's trying to accomplish, its goals. Companies have their goals and you have to satisfy them. But users usually have different goals and theirs are more important. Companies often imagine that their purpose is equivalent to their user's purpose. And that's one reason why those companies fail. So when your boss tells you to deliver some feature or some service to your user, you have to first find out what the user really wants. You have to seek out your users and listen to them. You need to learn their motivations and get into their heads to absorb their mental models. You question the nature of your product and you reshape the experience. You change the fundamental value of the product, and this, in turn, affects the strategy of the business. Working backwards is doing what you don't know how to do in the hopes of finding a better way to do it. Working forwards is doing what you do know how to do because you've done it before and you know it works. Above all, working backwards is a challenge to you, the designer, a challenge to step back and ask why, a challenge to look outside the known boundaries, to ask yourself and others some really tough questions. Eventually, you find yourself asking even bigger questions, beyond business, questions about our society, our government, and about social justice. The more you work backwards, the more connections you see in the world around you, the more inequality you detect, and the more opportunities to make a better world. Each way of working has different characteristics. Some of the differences between working forwards and backwards are, forwards confirms what you think, while backwards discovers something new. Forwards optimizes the existing, while backwards develops an opportunity. Forwards is brittle. Backwards can adapt to changes. Forwards concentrates on constraints and requirements, while backwards looks at new possibilities. Forwards asks, where are we right? But backwards asks, where are we wrong? Now let's talk about the first strength of working backwards, knowing who your user is and what they're trying to accomplish. My company, Cooper, is an innovation consulting company headquartered in San Francisco. We have clients large and small around the country and around the world. Cooper uses what we call the goal-directed method because it's based on understanding users' goals. While we tailor our efforts for the particular situation, everything we do is based on the simple idea that knowing the user's goals helps you to design for them. First, you identify your user. Who are they? What differentiates them? 
Second, you determine what their desired end state is. What is their goal? Then third, you find out what motivates them to get there. Why do they want it? Knowing these three things informs everything a company must do to innovate. And if you lose sight of any one of them, it doesn't matter how cool your products are, you will not succeed. <coughs> Excuse me. Cooper is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. What is that in internet years? 25 years ago, designing digital systems was in its infancy. Now, I had been building them for 15 years, so I knew the territory. But there were no academic programs, no books, no process, no tools, no terminology, no job roles, and no industry credibility. We had to invent both a practice and a profession. And all we had was our commitment to making software easier for humans to use. At each step of the way, we worked from first principles. Who is the user? What are their goals? Why? We started out as an interaction design company, showing our clients how to get more done with fewer screens. But the more we worked backwards, the more powerful we became. We discovered that our tools and techniques for interaction design were precisely the tools needed to innovate. Using them, we assist our clients to create, to invent, and to transform their businesses from being product-centered to user-centered. And this is why today we call ourselves an innovation company. As my friend Molly Nix of Uber says, design is the process used to build products. This is a really interesting phrase. The design is not just a part of the process. It is the process. So when you work backwards, design is not just a part of business, but rather business becomes a part of design. Design is what informs every aspect of the business, and it has more to do with success than manufacturing, marketing, sales, or finance. Now, we don't have any illusions about being experts in our clients' business. They've been doing it for years, and it's almost certainty that they know who their users are and what they should provide them. The problem is typically that the correct answers are hidden amongst the incorrect ones, the way the trees hide the forest. A client once described us as experts at becoming experts. We know how to learn a lot from very modest input. Our job is to guide the client onto the right road, not to carve that road for them. Often our job is to show them a new way of seeing what they see every day. The value that we bring is our perspective as deeply interested outsiders. We enter as a tabula rasa, a blank slate without preconceptions. We're looking for unexpected patterns in amorphous data. We call our stance omnivorous and non-judgmental. We want to hear everything about anything from everyone. Or, as I like to say, we draw on our deep well of ignorance. Now, for the sake of practicality, this has to be done quickly. But speed is our ally here. Imagine you are trying to assess the quality of the smoothness of a surface. To get an overall read of the quality, you have to work backwards. You really want to sweep your hand quickly across the width of it to feel for any roughness. You touch it in one place to confirm a rough spot to repair, but you sweep across it to get the big picture of what needs work. So recently, one of Cooper's favorite clients provided a great example of how this works. And by the time we were done, both Cooper and the client were surprised by what we had learned. Mileage Plus is United Airlines' loyalty program, managing frequent flyer miles. 
They hired Cooper to help them generate more trading volume. They wanted more members to redeem more miles for more merchandise. Now, they already had lots of valuable data, but it didn't tell them much. They knew about their users' travel patterns, their incomes, their demographics, and market segmentation, but what exactly did that mean? Data is not information. User personas is one of my inventions that's been widely adopted in the design world. They are hypothetical archetypes based on empirical research that represent real users. Now, some people will tell you that personas are obsolete or that they don't work. I think they just don't know how to make or use them. We find personas to be one of the most effective tools in our kit, and we use them on virtually every project we do. Senior Cooper designers Nate Clinton, who's here today, and Steve Caldy went into the field and observed mileage plus users in their natural habitat. They weren't trying to find out what offers they would like most, but instead sought to discover the user's goals. Nate and Steve found three groups with different goals. They then created three representative personas. Neil, the million miler, the road warrior, all he wants is comfort. He wants his flight upgrades and legroom. And Margaret, who flies for business, but not very often, she loves collecting her miles and she's dreaming of that big trip she's going to take. Bradley, the digitally adept millennial youth, he doesn't fly that much, but he sure likes to get free stuff. Now, these personas are not based on demographics, but on what they want and why they want it. The client mostly liked Neil and Margaret because they're already the biggest users and seem to provide the best opportunity for growth. Now, we worked with two senior executives there. And the first executive was a marketing guy, and he knew what he wanted from the very beginning. Their current solution was emailing attractive merchandise offers, but the members mostly ignored these emails. So executive number one wanted us to create a mobile app, pretty hot topic at the time, that would deliver even more attractive merchandise offers. It, this is classic working forwards, doing more of the same, just doing it harder. Now, we expressed our grave doubts about this plan, explaining that more advertisements on more platforms was not what their users wanted. And executive number one was really pissed off at us. He, he fired us, but that's a whole other story. Now, it was at this point that Mileage Plus executive number two stepped in. <clears throat> And he said, no, you're not fired, it's okay. Now, he was willing to work backwards. And the narrative that he heard from our personas was new, original, and compelling. He saw a previously obscured opportunity with the persona of young, tattooed Bradley. Executive number two then showed us an orphaned technology the company had previously worked on, but had then discarded. They could generate retail gift cards on the fly, in a store, on a smartphone. And they had thrown this technology away because they didn't see a way to make money with it. Working closely with executive number two, we developed a plan, a design, and then we built a mobile product. It was released as United Mileage Plus X, a smartphone app aimed squarely at the smallest but most promising market. Users could get at least double miles by using the app to buy merchandise in retail stores which was a key motivator for Bradley. The X app has been hugely successful for our client. With it, users generated over $100 million of trade in just the first year. We know members love it because 35% of them use it every day, and every month the app grows by 20% in this very desirable millennial market segment. All of the realities of innovation are present in this story. It took exploration, teamwork, and a willingness to question closely held beliefs. And it pissed people off. Now, the executive knew his gift card technology was cool, but it wasn't useful until we could all look at it through the lens of Bradley, the user. Field studies are an exercise in searching for what we don't know we don't know, 
rather than as a confirmation of our assumptions. And as is often the case, the client already had the answer, but they needed some outside perspective to help them to see it in its true light. The Mileage Plus X app nicely demonstrates another important notion, and it is that working forwards is an integral part of the process. First we did the sweep, and then we did the touch. Now, executive number one was a smart guy. He may have fired us, but he was a smart guy. Now, as a lifelong entrepreneur, I know that his self-confidence and his relentless drive is what makes products real. It is indispensable to success. But I've also been a lifelong inventor, an innovator, so I know that my constant willingness to question assumptions is equally indispensable. It's the quality that innovates and delights users. So I arrive at this axiom. Your ego gets it built, but your humility gets it loved. To succeed in a world of innovation, you have to have both. Okay, now let's talk about the second strength of working backwards, helping you to see possible solutions. <clears throat> so, in 2005, I took a year of machinist training at night at City College, a two-year technical college in San Francisco. That's my classroom. I learned how to shape steel on a lathe and milling machine. These are my two biggest class projects, a vise and a pair of involute gears. Now, the instructor would give us a blueprint of what we had to make, then demonstrate the method, and then let us do it for ourselves. Now, this ancient craft isn't about radical innovation, but uh, it's about mastery of tools and processes. The thing about cutting steel is that it isn't very forgiving. If you aren't doing it right, things go pear-shaped very quickly. So I worked backwards. I would measure, plan, set up my work, then stop and ask around. Then I'd measure again, change my setup, plan, measure, all before I put the tool to the metal. And I began to notice an interesting pattern. I always was the last student to start cutting steel. But even more interesting, I was always the first student to finish, and with good results, too. The lesson here is a simple one. Starting sooner doesn't mean finishing sooner. You need to be willing to give yourself time to be correct. The surprise is that this lesson comes straight out of the industrial age. In the digital world, it's even more true. And not because the technology is so hard to change, but because people have already made up their minds, and minds are harder to change than software. In general, for most people, it doesn't come naturally to work backwards. Your gut intuition and your common sense aren't good enough anymore, if they ever were. Human awareness and behavior is deeply biased. Over the last few decades, the science of human cognition has made remarkable advances. Contrary to popular belief, humans do not hear what we think we hear, we do not see what we think we see, and we don't make decisions on rational grounds. Accepting this truth is hard for any one of us, but it's particularly hard for business people who have depended on common sense for centuries. My new friend, John Manusian created this delightful codex of known human cognitive illusions, any one of which might lead us astray, but taken together, there are so many of them, you can see how defenseless we are to our own misunderstandings and misconceptions. Now, adding insult to injury is that a subset of these illusions whose sole effect is to make us disbelieve the truth and instead double down on our own goofy 
thinking. Now these include such illusions as confirmation bias, where we only listen to things that agree with what we already know, and zero risk bias, where we'd rather be certain than correct. Now cognitive biases pervade institutions as well, and they manifest as tacit cultural taboos. For example, most companies are biased towards success. This means that no matter how much they say, you're, you're, it's okay to fail fast, failure, believe it, is not good for your career. Now, most companies are also biased toward action, which means that they reward hard work more than they reward patient reflection, thinking about what work should be done. It takes strenuous mental effort to think objectively. Common sense is just our cognitive biases speaking. And it makes me wonder if we're subject to this daunting plethora of bad ways of thinking, how could humans have ever emerged from the ooze? Our brains fool us. Well, in his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, the Nobel Prize winner Daniel Kahneman explains, humans have two entirely separate mechanisms of thought that he calls fast and slow. So if I ask you your name, the fast part of your mind answers automatically. But if I ask you to multiply 16 by seven, you stop walking. That's the slow thinking part. Now we all have one and it works just fine, but it consumes a lot of energy, so it acts very lazy. Anytime our fast thinking mind offers an alternative answer, we snap it up before we bother to get our slow thinking mind out of bed. So we think, yesterday we made money, so tomorrow if we do the same, we'll make more money. That's fast thinking. But if we do something new and different, will that make money? Ah, to answer that demands that we wake up our slow thinking mind. That's hard work. Now, no doubt many of you have noticed the clever parallel between slow thinking and working backwards. When you work backwards, you have to engage the slow thinking part of your mind. And it's another clue to why working backwards is counterintuitive. People don't want to do it. In the industrial age, Westerners learned to make machines of gears and belts and levers. Now, no matter how complex such machines get, they remain simple deterministic systems. They're not complex systems like personal relationships, natural ecosystems, corporate cultures, and software platforms. Now, unfortunately, it's so much easier to think of complex systems as though they were simple machines with single simple causes and single simple effects. We tell stories and we cite anecdotes so that we can believe this, all in an effort to rely on the lazy, fast-thinking part of our minds and spare the hard work of thinking slowly about this complexity. The problem is that we can tweak complex systems as though they were simple machines. And we can often get predictable results. Unfortunately, that's not all we get. In John Gall's memorable phrase, anytime you act upon a complex system, the system always kicks back. In other words, you might get the result you want, but you will always get some other unintended consequences, and you probably won't like those. You can start fracking in Oklahoma, for example, and quintuple your yields of oil. But you also destroy the state's bedrock. In all of recorded history, Oklahoma had no measurable seismic activity. But when they began fracking in 2009, Oklahoma became the most seismically active state in the continental United States, with more than 1,000 earthquakes of 3.0 or higher every year. There are always 
unintended consequences when you mess with complex systems. And frequently the downside of the consequences is much greater than the predicted upside. Social media is another example of unintended consequences. At first, it was an amazing tool for keeping us together and uniting old friends. But the algorithms that Facebook and Twitter use create a personal echo chamber for each of us. Increasingly, the only thoughts and opinions we see are those that match our own. Gradually, we lose sight of what's really happening in the world. The creators of social media only wanted to help but no one could predict these second-order effects. Now it's time to talk about the third strength of working backwards, helping you to see the bigger picture. You and I are the practitioners. We're the backwards workers, the slow thinkers, who are building the future out of design and behavior. It's our job to ask the hard questions. And in my 40 years in the trenches, I've come to know which questions are the hardest. The first tough question isn't, what should we do here? But rather, what is our goal here? The second tough question isn't, whose fault is this? But rather, whose responsibility is this? Our job doesn't stop at making a great product. Robert Oppenheimer, the inventor of the atomic bomb, made a great product. And upon seeing the bomb explode for the first time, he began to question the role of the atomic bomb in the world. He started working backwards, and he discovered that his real goal, his ultimate responsibility, was to be a good ancestor. We have now, as an industry, arrived at our own Robert Oppenheimer moment. When we work backwards far enough, our vision expands and we see beyond our product, even beyond our company, until we can sweep our hand across the fabric of the entire social world. And when we feel that, we know we have work to do. So we look up from our screens and we see a world rife with inequality. And the products we work on every day are often the root cause of that inequality. We see that our little microcosm of software, web apps, social media, and shopping carts has eaten the world. And now we're trying to digest it. Our legislative protections have failed. From a citizen's point of view, Uber is a taxi company. And Airbnb is a hotel chain. But because their business models are innovative, they claim to be something different, and they escape the regulations that protect us. Working backwards is the only way we're going to invent a legal mechanism that can keep pace with disruptive innovation. These are all unpredictable, unintended consequences of innovation. It's nobody's fault, but it's become our job to fix things. When we work backwards far enough, our goal is revealed not as making product or profit, but creating a peaceful, just, and fair society for everyone, one that we would be proud to pass on to our children. You may think, well, this, this isn't our job, we're just technologists tweaking bits. But increasingly, the levers of the economy are in our hands. When we wonder who's responsible to do this, we must ask ourselves Congressman John Lewis's famous question, if not us, then who? And if not now, then when? It may not be something we ask for, it may not be something we want, but the responsibility for and the power to create a just and peaceful society is more in our hands than it is in anybody else's. How can we use our privilege as educated and affluent people to achieve this desired end state? We are like the keystone in the arch. The system won't stay up without us. 
Here's where our ego and our humility come together to make our world better. And we have a big job in front of us. All right. Now you see the power of working backwards. It connects you to your users so you can really get to know them and understand their motivations and goals. And it gives you a fresh point of view so that you can find innovative approaches. And it gives you the bigger picture so that you can see how your work fits into the larger world. Working backwards has implications not just for your product, but for your teams, your company, and our society. When you become an innovator, you become more powerful. And that means you must also become more responsible. You need to assess not just the immediate value of your creativity, but the long-term effects of it. There are those in our society who idolize people who make a lot of money and buy big houses and yachts. Not me. I want to elevate people who fight inequality. Gustavo Petro, the mayor of Bogota, said, a developed country is not a place where the poor have cars. It's where the rich use public transportation. This is the kind of thinking that I respect. A designer who makes their projects part of the larger social world and makes the world better, one app at a time. No project is too small for working backwards. The way to create a better world is to make certain that every tiny piece of the world you create makes you a better ancestor. Thank you. Alan, thank you very much. I think we still have a few minutes for questions. I'm happy to take questions. Anyone? Don't be shy. Why? We had a question here. Why? Why? That's the question. Why? Well, I'll tell you why. My state is on fire. Puerto Rico is underwater. There are countries around the world under the threat of fascism. And don't for a minute think that this has anything to do other than the technological tools that we're creating. Okay? It's not okay for us to say somebody else is doing this to us. We need to say we're doing this and we're going to change and we're going to fix it. You know, they, you're not supposed to say I'm sitting in traffic. You are traffic. I can't think of anybody more powerful than digital practitioners. You know, people ask me, you know, what do you say if your boss asks you to do something that's morally questionable? That's tough. That's tough. But you know what you have to do. You have to take the stance. Because who else is going to do it? Business people have a goal. Their goal is to make money. Financial people have a goal. Their goal is to make money. You know, established, powerful political people, their goal is to continue their political power. They don't want to be a good ancestor. And that's what we all want. We all want a nice world for us, for our children, for our children's children. And what will make a nice world for all of us is if all of your children are happy and satisfied and don't live you know, under the threat of, of, of terror, totalitarianism, or, or climatic disaster. That's why. All right, Alan. Thank you very much. Let's all give, give a big hand of applause, big round of applause for Alan Cooper. Thank you very much. Thank you.